poodle skirts and saddle shoes, bell bottoms, bright red lipstick no matter what the occasion, full on beehive hairdos like the ones that stood up to like here-ish, very wide ties, very thin ties, right? Handlebar mustaches, like the really, really long ones, you know? Do any of these hit close to home for any of you? <laughs> I also fell into some of the passing fads of my generation, tight rolled ankles on my jeans, uh, Seattle grunge plaid flannel shirts that were my brother's, um, and he had about 70 pounds on me at the time. They were kind of big, and even, Dare I admit this, I tried really hard to do like the, the wave with the hair, you know, where it stood up, like the hair wall. Um, it never really worked all that well. Um, and instead, I ended up with a, a mullet. <laughs> that was a bad fifth grade haircut decision. <laughs> you should never, never do that. So I don't know if any of you have ever had occasion to flip through old church pictorial directories. Maybe some of you have some of them, um, you know, on the shelves in your house, we certainly have them in the office. And if you haven't yet had a chance to do it, I would highly recommend it. Um, inside these directories, it's not only the history of who the membership in our church has been um, throughout the years at any given time, but also the history of the fads, right, that have come and gone in the world. Some that have been resurrected over the years, like tie-dye, I don't think tie-dye will ever die. So there you go and others that have been relegated to the land of the Halloween costume, right? No matter what role fads have played in your life, however, my guess is that because you are sitting here this morning in this particular church, that church has not been one of the fads that has come and gone in your life. You see, I would argue that for a while there, especially around the 50s and 60s, church was a fad too. Right? It was what all the cool kids were doing. For some, church became the thing that they did because it was the thing to do. Right? Made you an upstanding member of society. It was where you met only the right people to spend time with and to raise your children with, and so on. Now, though, there are many competing demands for people's time, for the places to meet the right people, for the right organization to belong to, that church has unfortunately for, mem for many become just a passing fad. It is certainly tough balancing all of the demands of this world and with God's call to be a part of the church one with another. So my first words for all of you this morning really should have been thank you. <laughs> thank you for being a part of the Congregational Church of Brookfield that exists now in the world in 2011. Thank you to those of you who have been long-standing members of our church for sticking through both the wonderful and the difficult times. <laughs> Thank you to those of you who have arrived because you chose to come back to church because for it to have been a passing, a passing fad just wasn't enough for you. And thank you to those of you who may just be checking us out for the first time today because it means that there is a viability and a life, a future in the church as well. I watched a lot of you work and wander around that thing that we call around here the Yankee Fair and Barn Sale. <laughs> if you hadn't already guessed that it happened yesterday, it did. Uh, and people were wearing these brilliant stickers that the Church Growth Committee came up with that they said, ask me why I love my church, right? And I'm hoping that some of you had a chance to answer that question for some of the, vo the folks who came to visit and support our ministries yesterday or even to give your answers one to another in this place. Um, I was joking around with a few people early on in the day <laughs> about, you know, why is it that you like to come to our church? And, and some people were saying, oh, it's because our crazy pastors dance in the parking lot, or uh, it's because we have this great meal once a month, these little pieces of bread and, and all that kind of stuff. But, but if you really had a chance to share with somebody or had a chance to hear someone share with someone else why it is that they love our church, you may have had a chance to hear or speak about the way that God is working in people's lives right here and right now. Because it's for all of those reasons, whatever they may be for you, 
that we are here today, still standing after 254 years, while there are mainline churches all over the place that are closing each day. So is church a fad? Not here it isn't, and we thank God for that every day. And that's what Paul was writing about in his letter to the Thessalonians, right? It's now believed that these were the first words ever written in the New Testament, even before the Gospels were written down. Paul was writing to new communities that we have come to know as churches. And what he's writing about in these first words is thanks and praise to this particular community and to God for not making the way of Jesus Christ a passing fad held on to and talked about and lived only while Paul and Silvanus and Timothy were among them, but rather truly lived out even after the three who had planted the community had moved on. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our message of the gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit. This following Jesus stuff wasn't just a passing fancy for this new community. They had suffered persecution for being a part of it in the midst of the Roman rule that was in the land at the time, and they had not just heard the words of Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy about the good news of Jesus. They had taken it to heart, really made it a part of themselves, and become examples for others around about what it meant to be the people of this new way, of what became to be a new faith, of the faith that we claim for ourselves even today. Examples of their faith. I think this is what we have the opportunity to be each and every day, of course, but perhaps in a more focused and concentrated way on the day of our Yankee Fair. In my prayer yesterday morning with the folks who volunteered their time over in this building, I prayed that we would offer extravagant welcome to all those who entered in and that everyone might see the faith and spirit that helps us to do God's work and ministry as a community of Christians. If you ask me why I love my church, I say that it's because of all of you, and because in all of you and through all of you, the spirit is working in some pretty serious ways in this place. And I say serious ways even when I realized that yesterday the ministry of Jesus Christ was being done while wearing clown makeup, and cheese heads, and Mrs. Quinsland, an absolutely beautiful braided Viking hat over at the Parsonage toy shop, right? That it was being done while playing air guitar and dancing goofily, I coined that term, uh, <laughs> in the parking lot to the sounds of Dan's garage band and the DJ. It was being done while deals were being made and the fruits of the talents of many, not only those nearby, but some far away whom we may never meet, were being exchanged to help support the work and ministry of this church. The spirit was working its way through this place yesterday and through the nearly 300 volunteers that helped to make yesterday's fair a success. And you know what the best part is? It goes out into the world from here, my friends. Hopefully our visitors yesterday will have caught a little bit of the spirit bug that was flowing through this place and bring it out into the world, whether in a slightly changed attitude, a bit more care for neighbors, a better sense of what it can mean to be church. It will go out into the world in the form of all the support offered for the ministries beyond our walls that John was talking about just a few moments ago as donations went to organizations like Family Services Network and Jericho Project, the Nicaragua effort, Big Brothers and Big Sisters, and, and as half of the proceeds from the fair will be given to the Association of Religious Communities for their ministries in this area, and also to help us make this place a home to a new refugee family through the Refugee Resettlement Program next summer. It will go out into the world in the form of our youth who go to Silver Lake with some support from our church. Yesterday's fair was a true example of what can be done when a community of faithful people come together and work together for God. So, is the church the fair? 
At CCB, that's certainly a part of what we are. And we thank God for that opportunity and for the hard work that makes that statement reality for us. But although I would love the spirit and the excitement of the Yankee Fair to fill this place each and every day, if the church were just the Yankee Fair, we would be done for the time being, right? It would be passed. So aside from collecting the payments for the silent auction items that are yet to be picked up and paying the bills that come in during the next few weeks, aside from Walt Fisher, who's already begun the countdown for next year, <laughs> and Nancy Vodra, who will begin quilting this afternoon for next year's quilting booth, we would be all set, right? We could all go home. I ask that you just wait until I say amen at the end of the sermon first. <laughs> right? No need to be here again until next summer when things kick into high gear again, right? But don't go grabbing your hats and coats and purses just yet, please. <laughs> because we're all here today, the day after the fair, and as much as it may be because all we really wanted to do was hear the number, right, that was announced earlier, and to hear what a wonderful success that ministry was. It's also because we have the kind of community of faith that I believe can last well into the future. And because the truth is that I believe we need the church for the future, but only if we are really willing to put ourselves into it. And that brings us to Jesus's words in the Gospel of Matthew this morning. This is one of those passages that has often been made to support the distinct separation of church and state. And yet if we look a bit more closely at it, we realize that what Jesus was really talking about was giving our whole lives over to do God's work. Our church lives, our home lives, and yes, even our political lives. Because they are all a part of who we are as God's children. The Herodians and the Pharisees coming together in this passage was odd enough to begin with, as the first group was all about supporting the Romans and the second was all about staying true to being Israel together. But they had one thing in mind, and that was to trip Jesus up, to entrap him. They were looking for yet another reason to have him blacklisted and even sent to death. And it wasn't just because he was challenging the other faiths of the time. It was because he was a deeply political guy as well. And he was causing quite the stir with the government and the status quo. So they come to him and ask him whether or not they, as people of faith, should be paying taxes. And what does he do? It's quite brilliant, really. He has them hand over a coin. And now a quick lesson here. According to the rules of the time, no Roman coins should have been allowed in the temple, which is where Jesus was teaching, and where they came to confront him. And if you recall the Ten Commandments, there were to be no graven images, and the king of the time certainly considered himself and entreated others to consider him a god. So two strikes against the challengers already, and here goes Jesus. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. Go ahead and give him back the money if you wish. Give back to God what is God's. And what did Jesus mean? Well, if you believe that we are all God's beloved children created in God's image, then we are the imprinted fair of God, my friends. And we need to be giving back to God all that we have and all that we are in gratitude and thanksgiving for all that God gave us first. Jesus wasn't afraid to answer that question because he trusted that his followers would be whole, multifaceted human beings who could figure out how to serve God with their whole lives. That means that Jesus trusts us to be able to do the same, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And if we really want the church to be the future as well, then we need to be able to be bold and courageous enough to serve God with our whole lives, to bring our faith to our decisions about who to vote for come no this November and next November, to share our faithful response to the issues of hunger throughout our world by participating in the UCC's Mission One campaign and sending a letter to our representatives in Washington on behalf of Bread for the World. And if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say Mission One, then read your October Crossways and look on our website. It means being willing to delve into the deep issues of our time, to discuss what is happening no matter which side of the issue you fall down on with the Occupy Wall Street movement that has taken over our world now, not just our cities. 
about the war that continues to rage on in Iraq and Afghanistan, about the reasons that we need to have a booth for serve at our fair, to support artisans who are just trying to have the basics of food and shelter and clothing in their lives, while there are others of us who don't have to worry about those things at all. It means, as Richard Stewart so eloquently spoke during the men's fellowship service a few weeks ago, it means making our faith relevant, not only for our lives, but for the community and the world around us. Because that's what's going to ensure the future of the church. And although Bryn and I joked with each other on Friday night after spending the day baking for the fair with our families, that if all else failed, we could open up a bakery aptly named Cookies for Christ. <laughs> we don't really want that to happen. So <laughs> because we have seen the amazing things that the church, this church, can do for each other, for our community, for the world. So the challenge is to keep it going and to perhaps dig into some of the deep stuff that we've only skated the surface of together. It means praising God for the ways that God breaks into our lives while using that as motivation for days and weeks and months to come. So is the church the future, my friends? Serving God with our whole selves as a talented, vibrant, spirit-filled, motivated, and hopefully empowered family of faith? May it be so. Amen.